Welcome to this video brought to you by AbraVibe. Visit our webpage abravibe.com to learn about vibrations and vibration analysis. So this is a demonstration of the impact testing uh, GUI software uh, for um, AbraVibe toolbox. Uh, before I go into the software I want to talk a little about the uh, data format that we use. So when we use, when we do impact testing with the Abravibe toolbox, we just record time signals of the force and accelerations. And we record that in one long go. For example, during two minutes, you just record the time signals uh, of your, let's say, four channels, as in my example soon. Uh, on channel one, you have the force sensor. On channels two, three, and four, you have your accelerometers. And then you select, for example, two minutes recording time. And during these two minutes, you hit the structure, for example, every 20 seconds to obtain uh, a number of impacts during that time. Uh, then you store the data in uh, MATLAB format in a particular format that we call uh, the imp time format. That's uh, documented in the Abravibe user manual, so I don't need to explain that here. But the essential thing is that in one of these files, you have simultaneous recordings of the force and accelerations uh, for each uh, position where you do the impact. So let's uh, fire up the uh, main GUI, which is fired up by the command impact GUI. Okay, this is the main interface. Here you control the input files that you want to use, the output files, uh, a pre-test section where you uh, select basically the optimum FFT settings. You can see the uh, current uh, FFT settings. You have a load and a save settings button and you have a continue button which takes you on to the post-processing. So first we need to select some files to work with and you see that the uh, software remembers the last time you were in it. So um, right now we're uh, just uh, uh, selecting these uh, three files that I want to work with. Uh, then I go to uh, output files. I select the directory, uh, which is predefined here. Uh, then I, pre uh, I uh, type in a prefix. I want to call my uh, files. And then there is a, a default letter for the type of file. So the software saves frequency responses, coherence functions, and force spectra. And these are uh, respectively called uh, ski H, ski C, and ski F, uh, and then followed by the number. And the number starts with one and then adds up. Uh, so ski H1 and ski C1, they are the frequency response and coherence that belong to the same measurement. Okay, the next step after selecting the files is to go to pretest. Here I get a list of the same files I've selected in the imp as input files and I select one of these files and one of the channels inside the, that file, one of the response channels. And then I go to start, which opens up this Optimize FFT settings GUI. This GUI has four steps, select impact, select triggering, select block size and select windows. So we run these uh, one by one. So we start by plotting the data here, and then the software asks me to select a number of impacts here, which I want to use for the uh, optimization. Okay. Another feature is if you, particularly if you have a low um, trigger condition, sorry, if I go back to plot here, you will see that you get double impact um, indications by the um, uh, by a red uh, plot. Okay, we'll go back here to 11 and then I select my impacts again. So we're all done uh, for the uh, next step, which is to set the trigger level and pre-trigger and to investigate if you want, uh, to see that the pre-trigger is uh, really long enough so that you have, you see here in green, that you really have a zero uh, part, a part where the force is zero before the impact arrives. So the trigger level and pre-trigger seems to work fine for these data. The next step is to select the block size. Let's start with a small block size. Plot the frequency responses. Okay, this function selects one block size below 
and one block size above the selected block size. And then it computes the frequency response with all three settings. And the idea here is that you see if you have too small block size, you have a bias error. And you can notice that you have a bias error by the fact that when you increase the block size, the peak increases. So as long as you see an increase in peak like this, you have a bias error in your FRF. So what we do is we go back and select a more proper block size, like 16Ks, and then we replot it. Okay, we zoom in on the uh, peak again here, and now you see that the, s the second two, the, s the largest two block sizes, give you the same peak level, which means that the bias error is, uh, is uh, essentially eliminated already for the block size of 16K. So in this case, we select the 16K block size uh, as the proper block size. Next step is to, um, I, I just uh, put the windows to 100% and then I plot the time window here or the time plots. So here you see the time impact for the first impact and the corresponding response function. Uh, so in the upper, the middle plot is the uh, response function signal and the uh, one below is the response signal with the exponential window added, but right now we don't have one. So the first thing I do is I select a um, force window, select the time plot again, and then I can see that the um, impact really uh, happens before the force window starts to decay. So that seems uh, to be a good force window. Next step then is to optimize the uh, the uh, exponential window and that's preferably done by using a, uh, a frequency domain approach. So here we plot the frequency response, the coherence and at the bottom plot the force spectrum. Let me show you the force spectrum there without the uh, force window. Then you see that there is some noise particularly at low frequencies in this case. With the force window of 2% we really remove and make the force window a really smooth one. Okay, to finally optimize the exponential window, we look at the coherence essentially here. Uh, as we increase the uh, exponential window by decreasing the value here, the value, by the way, is the exponential window end factor in percent. So 10 here means that the last value of the exponential window, which goes down exponentially here, the last value is 0.1. 10%. Okay, so if we reduce this now, you will look, if you look carefully here, you will see that the dips in the coherence gradually decrease, okay, as we increase the power of the exponential window. Okay, somewhere along there, maybe 1% is a good choice in this case. So we're done with the settings. We press export, and that exports the settings to the main GUI, and we can now continue with post processing. If you want to, you could save your settings now if you want to be able to uh, load these uh, settings back. Uh, but we go straight to continue. That opens up the, the final GUI. Okay, this is the impact processing. So this is where all the time data that we have selected in the input files are processed down to frequency response functions, coherence functions, and force spectra. To the, uh, on the left-hand side of this uh, GUI, First, we can select which or uh, which channels to plot in the uh, in the plots. So you can select or deselect any of these uh, channels. Okay. Next step is uh, on the right hand side. You can select which impacts to use for the averaging. And by default, all the impacts are selected. But you can deselect some of these, and you can find that the coherence significantly improves sometimes. Uh, usually if you find only the good impacts, you can get a, a coherence which is much better like this than it was originally for all of them. Okay, so this is with all of them and this is with all those four, uh, sorry, those, it was number five. Okay, so this is probably a better estimate because the coherence is better. Um, so. That would be my choice in this case. Okay, before going on, I want to show you that we also have some different process modes here. So this is 
what we talked about so far was essentially what I would call traditional impact testing. Okay, where the averaging is done in the frequency domain and you have the H1 estimator in the background here. But we also have time synchronous uh, averaging. Okay, so what happens then is that you use each of the selected impacts uh, and you, uh, or the software, uh, averages the impacts in the, in the time domain and the responses also averages in the time domain. Uh, for this to work well, you should have uh, very similar force impacts in the time domain. You also notice here then that the coherence is just a straight line of unity. It's not really defined. And this is because what we do here is we average in the time domain. We take the FFT only of the output and input of the uh, FFT or, or of each of the signals the FFT results are then divided by each other to obtain the frequency response. So there is no coherence definition uh, or defined for such data. But sometimes the, uh, the um, FRF estimate could be better. And then finally, there is a, an optimum uh, method of uh, that, or an automatic method, I should say, that optimizes the coherence of each of these Okay, now it's not uh, implemented in my version here yet, so that's why it clicked here or it beeped here in the software, but it will be implemented. And you can very easily, since this is open software, plug in your own algorithms here, okay, um, if you would uh, want so. Okay, let's go back to the uh, process GUI. Let's say we want to do traditional impact testing. So we're actually done already. We have selected which channel we want to sh choose or uh, what we want to display here. And you should know that all, pro all channels are always processed here. So this is only for plotting purposes, these choices here. The impacts though, they affect the, the chosen impacts, they seriously affect the estimate you will obtain. So once we're done here with the first in this uh, list of, uh, of impacts, the first we select, and now actually when I select something here, I have to reselect the impact. Okay. Once we're happy with the choice of impacts and we're happy with the coherence and FRF, we just press save and next. That saves down here uh, to the directory that you have selected, sh sh saves at ski H1, ski H2, and ski H3. But actually, if you look up here, you also see that the coherences and force spectra are also stored. So although it reports only the frequency responses to not mess up the interface too much here. Okay, next file is automatically selected. So all we need to do now is we select some impacts for this one. And when we're happy with that, I don't care about that right now, we just select save and next, and then we get the next file here. Okay, and you select some impacts for this one. And when you're happy with that, we press save and next. And as I do that uh, now, the uh, GUI will uh, close because this is the last file in my series of files. Okay, and we have some uh, comments here, which says which files have been saved and in which directory. And that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, this is the uh, GUI. There is one more uh, uh, choice, merge files. If you want to choose that, uh, you get a, um, a GUI which uh, can be used to move files or copy files actually into the output directory. If you have your target files or your analysis files in several different directories, because maybe your data acquisition software always stores data in a particular directory, you can move the copy those files into a common directory that the impact GUI software can then use uh, for the automatic processing because this only works if you select files that are in the same directory. And that's it. The final thing you have full help function if you want to. Okay, if we click that now it came up in a, in a on another of my screens, but here is a, a uh, uh, help file with uh, some comments on how you should approach this software. So thanks for watching and uh, look for more at uh, abravibe.com. For example, you will find the Abravibe, the free toolbox for MATLAB and GNU Octave. You will find booked resources such as in your Ada list and also uh, a problem solutions manual. You will find MATLAB Octave examples 
and you will find more videos. Thanks for watching.